amongst this audience needs no real introduction. <coughs> okay. It's fair to say that without the work of Flying Earth, we probably wouldn't be where we are today and having the uh, discussion. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court ruling in April was clearly uh, a major stimulus uh, for this, uh, and I'm sure that story has uh, much further to go. So, can I invite uh, Alan to come? <coughs> Thank you very much, Alan. All good. Right, I thought I might just start with a, a very quick um, chronology, really, of, of how we got to where we are today. Um, it was really a five-year legal battle, uh, which started in 2011 in the High Court, um, and took us a long time until we got uh, to the Supreme Court, we, where we finally got a ruling which forced the government to take action. Um, so the well, Supreme Court ruling, um, as Roger mentioned, was the real driver for these new plans. Um, I think it's probably just worth emphasising how strong <coughs> the Supreme Court gave um, earlier this year. It issued what's, what we call a mandatory order, um, which in itself is highly unusual. Mm -hmm. The courts very rarely issue mandatory orders against government departments. They normally assume that the government department can be trusted to, to act on a, a non-binding declaration. So we, we were quite pleased, really, to see a mandatory ruling. We also got a mandatory order requiring action by a certain date, and that's almost unheard of, certainly in environmental cases uh, that I'm aware of. And this quote here really shows just how strongly the court felt about the situation in front of it. It demanded immediate action to address the issue. Now, there are lots of very well-qualified experts uh, who are following me, so I'm not going to go into the, the real technical detail of the plans. I think probably the most useful thing I can do is really sort of set the legal context uh, and leave to others to uh, decide whether they think the draft plans really, really um, come up to the mark set by the Supreme Court. So what does this mandatory order do? Well, first and foremost, it required the government to prepare new air quality plans. Those plans must comply with Article 23 mm -hmm. of the Ambient Air Quality Directive. Um, they were required to do a 40-day public consultation period, which, as I mentioned, has now closed, and then submit final plans to the European Commission by the end of the year. So these plans will be subject to the scrutiny of the European Commission, who, as you know, have initiated infringement proceedings, so they will be watching very closely uh, to see whether these plans really do comply with Article 23. But I think probably the government's bigger problem is that they've got to satisfy Fine Earth and the national courts that these plans comply with Article 23. And there the court has given us a bit of a helping hand. They took the unusual step of granting both parties the liberty to apply. It's a fairly obscure uh, legal mechanism. You have to dig so very deep in most legal textbooks until you find any reference to it. But basically all this does is give us a, a direct and fast route to go back to court if there is any dispute as to whether DEFRA has taken the correct legal approach when it comes to preparing these air quality plans. And then the court didn't actually make a ruling on what Article 23 means when it says that plans must achieve compliance in the shortest time possible. That wasn't actually at issue in this case uh, for various reasons, um, mainly because the case started in 2011, and through the course of time, um, that issue didn't, didn't arise until quite late in the day. But what the court did was give some pretty strong clues as to the legal approach that should be taken when it comes to as short as possible. And in particular, they reference uh, a case called Commission versus Italy. This is where Italy was uh, taken to court by the European Commission for failing to comply with PM10 limit values. Italy argued that they couldn't possibly comply with the PM10 limits for a variety of reasons beyond their control, including unfavorable uh, meteorological conditions, unfavorable topography, technical problems, uh, and, and these sorts of issues. The European Court of Justice had absolutely no sympathy for these kinds of um, 
we call really safe the sort of no ifs, no buts approach when it comes to compliance with limit values. Protection of human health really trumps all other considerations in European law. So that's the test that these plans are going to be held up against should they uh, come before a court, which I think it's fair to say is looking increasingly likely. The plans must comply with Article 23 and Annex 15 to Article 23. The main requirement, of course, is that they contain appropriate measures so as to keep the exceedance period as short as possible. But there are other requirements tucked away in Annex 15. There must be a timetable for implementation of each measure. There must be an estimate of the improvement that each measure has on air quality and the date for compliance with the limit values. Another interesting feature of the Supreme Court ruling was that they said, okay, this is an Article 23 plan, but it can't be any less onerous or stringent than if this was an Article 22 plan. <laughs> if you remember, the government many years ago was arguing that uh, it didn't have to apply for a time extension for the compliance limit to limits because it was using Article 23 instead. So the Supreme Court has said, these plans must be at least as rigorous as an Article 22 plan. So they must adopt the checklist approach in Article 22, and that lists a range of measures which must be considered, uh, including various traffic management schemes, low emission zones, and road crossing. Yeah. So what have we got in the, in the new plans? Well, it's all a case of deja vu, really. It means they've done exactly what they did in 2011 which is to cobble together all the plans that have been uh, constructed at the local authority level, except that those plans aren't sufficient, except that those plans will not achieve compliance until after 2020, in the case of London 2025, and yet propose only one new national measure, in this case uh, a national framework for what we now call clean air zones, but what we can know as low emission zones, now, we've been calling for a national network of low emission zones for years, um, but that's not what we've got here. All the government is, is doing is saying that it will produce a national framework at some point in 2016. We're still waiting for a further consultation on exactly what the, the national framework will look like. But we know it's not going to be mandatory. Local authorities will be left to decide whether they actually implement a clean air zone or not. As such, there is no timetable for implementation. We don't know if, or if ever, clean air zones will actually be implemented. And if you are, if you have a, a long memory, remember this from the 2011 plans, when DEFRA said they would investigate the feasibility of a national framework for low emissions. And I call me cynical, but those low emissions, that national framework never saw the light of day and uh, I'm rather sceptical as to whether this one will either. Now, the other point I want to focus on here is, is the money. Now, these clean air zones aren't mandatory for local authorities. What same local authority is going to implement a clean air zone without some further funding to do so? The plans commit a laughable £500,000 for 2015 to 2016 for local authorities, uh, which compares to the 20 something million in infrastructure costs that the that DEFRA uh, estimate would be required, just the infrastructure costs of eight clean air zones. So it's a laughably small amount of money. Um, we know that all measures in the plans are subject to the spending review, so who knows whether that 500000 will be cut even further. Um, who knows how many of the measures included in the plans will be cut because of lack of funding. So I think what we've really seen is the national government has quite cynically attempted to pass the buck, pass the problem down to local authorities at a time when they're facing unprecedented budgetary constraints uh, and really try to wash their hands of the matter. So I think it will really come down to, to this man. I think George Osborne really holds the key here. Uh, if we are to see major progress, if we are to see the immediate action that the Supreme Court uh, ordered, 
George Osborne is going to have to put his hand in his pocket and make significant sums of money available. We know that the government are quite prepared to invest major sums of money in transport infrastructure projects. Why can't they do that with air quality, which, uh, as we know, is, is responsible for thousands and thousands of early deaths each year in the UK, and will continue to do so for as long as the government continues to prevaricate. I'll leave it there, but as you can probably guess from, from what I've said, it's difficult to see without a major, major change in government attitude that we won't end up back in court at some point in 2016. These plans do not comply with Article 23 of the Directive, they do not comply with the Supreme Court order, and we will go back to court next year to make sure that they do, if DEFRA don't <coughs> seriously fuck up their ideas in the final plan. Quite uh, very good first contribution from Alan there. Perhaps a new surprise to those in the audience, and I'm sure we'll hear um, similar points uh, coming up. So, um, as I mentioned before, we're going to uh, have a discussion at the end. So, if you have um, comments and questions on Alan's presentation, <laughs> write them down, keep them in your head or whatever, and we'll come back to those um, after I've given my presentation at the end. But in the meantime, let's keep the ball rolling, and uh, I'd now like to invite Helen to come up. Mm. Helen Aspam, of course, uh, long been in um, the air quality session, and uh, a huge want of knowledge. <laughs> Over to you, Alan. This will be a bit more... Technical. Well, thank you for inviting me today. And um, I thought I would uh, just concentrate on two. One is the. Health impact. And how that's coming in with the cost benefit analysis um, in justifying more costs. And um, then I think the clean air zones, because that's the thing so, um, this report here that's been produced, which will change quite a lot of what we do in air quality assessments, um, and I'm really pleased that DEFRA have recognised the advances that have been made by WHO in attributing direct costs, uh, direct effects to exposure to NO2. And that's been taken over by Comiat, and Comiat have actually given them interim advice so that they have been able to put together this <coughs> new cost benefit analysis for the health impact of NO2. Um, I think you, a lot of you will have seen in the press this recent assessment of uh, 23,500 <coughs> early deaths a year, um, and looking at the cost 13.3 billion. Um, that's rather to what is worth putting into uh, improving our air quality. And just as an education, the old cost of loss of harm were about half the cost in the uh, DEFRA cost benefit analysis. Now they're going up to 120,000 for the cost of loss in the urban area. So that is going to have quite an effect on a lot of the planning and future assessments we make for air quality. So, I think that's a, a step forward. Um, now going on to the clean air zone. Um, two reports that you have seen, the draft plans, and also the uh, technical assessment and the work done with the PCM model, the official model for looking at compliance with limit values. And um, this relates, I, I do think that we do need a clear framework for having clean air zones. So I welcome that. But um, the big crucial thing here is that the limit for diesel cars, or for all cars, um, going into the high density of the or CSA, um, is the Euro 6 standard diesel for the 80 milligrams per kilometre. <coughs> that, of course, is different from what we've got in the ULE local London, which is the Euro 6. So immediately we get into this big discrepancy between the standard and the real world emissions. Here I'm going to cheat and take a little bit of work from Nick um, mm -hmm. on the real world emissions. 
uh, and it's worked down by one of our students who I think is sitting in the back row there. Um, <clears throat> but I think a lot of us who've done air pollution modeling are familiar with the code emission factors and we think of emissions as being nice mean function of speed. When you actually look at the data, it's not like that at all. Um, it's very dependent to the big peaks in emissions, but it's not when you accelerate um, and when you drive. There's going to be very big difficulty in trying to set a standard PEMS test as has been proposed by the Commission and where we're not horrified that the current suggestion is that they should be allowed to emit twice as much as the Euro uh, ABC standard. Uh, in the real world testing. So how that's going to work out, I really don't know. Um, so, um, this is Rafa's work. What she's been doing is taking these cars and comparing what the emissions from Euro 6 diesels look like as compared with the um, Euro standard, which is the red line, the green dots. 13, 14 different cars. The green dots are what we got from driving vehicles around, or what Nick got from driving cars around, uh, urban cycles and motorway cycles. And <coughs> you can see that these were in urban Euro 6, but there's a very wide variation between diesel vehicles. We can't think of all Euro 6 diesel vehicles as one category. You know, VW, we tend to say all VW are all, all Euro 6 diesels. Are terrible. I don't think that's the case. Some of them can meet the standard. Um, also, shown there is what we tend to use on the COVID, and we tended to find higher emissions than are actually coming out of the COVID model. Um, okay. But the other thing I want to concentrate on is um, <coughs> the proportion of NOx that's emitted as primary NO2 which for diesel cars is much higher than petrol. So, um, COVID seems 30 percent, we're finding even higher percentages of the NOx coming out of primary energy. So we're trying to go into the technological reasons for that. Um, but what it means is that your Euro 6 diesel is emitting, on average, at least 40 times as much primary NO2 as a petrol car, maybe 100 times. And if you're close to the curve, that is rather important. <coughs> so the legislation on emissions focuses on total NOx. And the limit values for health, the roadside, are for NO2. And somehow we have to address that difference of how are we going to control the NO2, primary NO2. <coughs> okay, Just um, <coughs> this is the kind of modelling that we're doing at Imperial. So each of these lines represents a road in London. Um, the, in the middle, you've got what your NO2 concentration should be at the roadside, with a bit of as usual, assuming to the of the Euro 6. Now, if we try and improve those on the right hand side and go to the Euro 60, as a sort of proposed interim step um, in 2017, that gives us some improvement. But we've got to go way beyond that, at least as far as the um, <coughs> actually the factor of one in, standard, in order to get rid of that remaining excuse. <coughs> the left hand side, just for fun, we did a sort of experiment. <coughs> what would happen if people can't image the same amount, about five percent primary energy as a petrol car? And that does much more to solve our problem. So I think it's a really important issue that we need to look at. <coughs> so, conclusions. I very much welcome the new guidelines <coughs> that Jeff has brought up on valuing the health impact of NO2. I think it's a good step forward. I think we need clarification on diesel cars and vans that will be allowed entry to the clean air zone, which is real crux of the matter. <coughs> and my feeling is that we need to differentiate between the different Euro diesel contracts. We're not going to get the motor industry or the oil industry suddenly abolishing diesel. We need to put pressure on motor manufacturers uh, 
to really clean up their act and show which people can be clean and how clean they can be. So that's really something which we're pushing for. And in that, we need to address the transfer factions in it too, as well as the one. And I think we need more to come to work that maybe is doing. Mm -hmm. We've got a very bad data base when it really comes to the jump of bands. We've got very little data on bands. And yet there is about a big cost. So there's a lot that needs to be done. And I would like to see funding for that kind of work. To really get a good database to have the information that we can add. Okay. Yes,
it is saying that Euro 6 vehicles on Copeworth are emitting approximately twice the official levels. Whereas this is saying real world is about four times the level. And that's me reading the graph. I mean, there's not actually a huge, huge amount of technical you know, underlying raw data there to say, but reading off the graph, it looks like it's saying about double. So there's a dissonance there. As a sidebar, I'm not going to go on it, but we shouldn't completely forget gasoline in this. Um, generally, they are 20% on average under the 60 <coughs> milligram limit. But 21% of the vehicles we've tested in real-world driving do exceed the limit. And some of them, the grey this is the grey is the actual individual cars, where this is the rolling average. You see, some of them can be really quite high. So certain technologies are vulnerable. But let's not take a, a, a diversion. Because I wanted to show you this, which is just take the NO2. And I completely agree, I mean, Helen's point is a very valuable one out the primary NO2. This is what the real world NO2 is um, out of these vehicles. And there's been improvements again, but we're running essentially now that the amount of NO2 on average is 80 milligrams per kilometer. So the regulated level of NOx together of 80 milligrams is actually all being emitted as in NO2, and then the NO is on top of that. That's, that's, um, uh, it's coincidental, but it's quite interesting to you know, emphasize that there is a large proportion of NO2 coming out. And this is my summary. These are, in it, if anything, the key stats. We've got three columns. Euro 5 diesels, Euro 6 diesels, gasoline, Euro 5 and 6 together. So real world NOx has come down on average from 773 to 299. Gasoline tiny. Conformity factor hovering around that four times that full stuff. But the fraction of NO2, the mean has ticked up a little bit between 0, 05 and 6, but more importantly, the spread has grown. These are manufacturer averages. So the lowest emitting NO2 manufacturer, 27%, highest 66 Now it's 17 to 8 <coughs> So depending on the configuration and the types of after treatment strategies that are consumed, <coughs> is generating different manufacturers with dramatically different characteristic NO2 fractions. And again, from a policy point of view, but that is unregulated at the moment, the NO2. And I'd say for future regulation, we'll have to address that. Uh, because you may find here that you've got someone with a very low, um, if you had, you could have relatively low NOx, but it's an extremely high NO2 fraction. Actually, that may be worse than one with higher NOx and a very low NO2 fraction. That needs to needs to be watched right And I don't see the death for consultation really as a very back issue. I'm not going to talk about cold start for DPF actually because we're not got time, but essentially uh, it's forty percent more for a diesel car. In cold start NOx is forty percent higher while it's cold, and during DPF it's forty percent higher as well. So that's all you need to know on that. But I'm happy to talk more if anyone wants to know about that. This is where this is where it comes to, therefore, with all that data, what is our view on the death of consultation, and what will Euro 6C do? My, my view overall is that it's really not as strict as it could be, and so I have, I have concerns. <coughs> so 80 milligrams is the limit. Um, for a start, put that in context. 31 milligrams is the limit in, in the United States for equivalent cars, tier 2 bin 5 cars. So, don't pretend that we can't pretend that Europe is somehow massively ahead of the game um, when the Euro, US has been achieving that limit for many, many years now. Uh, the bit that we can make it more district is, is the real on road validation of that. Because their 31 is, is a laboratory test. <coughs> so that's where the 6C part with the PEMS test is crucial. Now, as Helen mentioned, a 2.1 conformity factor has, has been provisionally agreed. So that means in the real world PEMS element, it can emit up to uh, 168 milligrams per kilometer and for the car still to be legally compliant. And then that's meant to ratchet down to 1.5 in 2021. Should emphasize that this is not yet approved. This has got to go to the European Parliament and the European Council, and there is a growing head of political steam uh, amongst political parties in the, in the Parliament to rub through this out and say it's not tough enough. So we're, that, even that is not there yet. So we've got that, but it then gets more intriguing because it isn't actually 2.1 times the whole of the PEMS, uh, for the whole of the PEMS cycle, 
there are going to be certain elements of the Thames cycle that will get mathematically excluded from the calculation. Hmm. And this is the boundary condition. Uh, of course, some you may or may not have heard of these, but and this will likely be all agreed behind the scenes. Um, and it's to exclude extreme driving. So if, if the Thames cycle has put in, been unduly harsh on the car, the manufacturers are allowed to exclude that from the calculation. The problem is the definition of extreme driving is entirely subjective and subject to negotiation. And it'll, the effectiveness of the regulation will heavily depend on whether pretty much everything is included in the calculation, except for you know, genuinely extreme things, or if even moderate acceleration is carved out, then it will render the thing entirely useless. Uh, and it's that extreme that how the outcome uh, could turn out. We've got a long way to go before we can really form a view on whether 6C will be effective. There's also something you know, extremely exciting called transfer function, which is a sort of different angle on the same issue, where manufacturers have been asking for where there is extended driving to have a mathematical function to reduce that in the overall calculation <coughs> uh, by some miracle of modelling. Uh, I don't think that's got enough political head of steam to happen, but it's another initiative on the table to in some way downweight the more extreme driving conditions. So that's so there's a, that loophole there to be aware of. Then there's the delay. Um, I mean, everyone's looked a lot at the 2.1, but actually the key date in my mind is actually 2019. Because all models won't have to conform until 2019. Uh, new model ranges will have to from September 2017. And a cynic might say that there may be a lot of new model ranges come out in August 2017. Um, so it's possible four years from today could really be the date that things start to bite. And then if we're talking about meeting, you know, air quality zone meeting the, the limit in 2020, if the genuine 6C cars are not coming onto the market until 2019, you'll have virtually none of them on the road by 2020. Uh, and that's even if the boundary conditions are quite tight. So I think that's, again, there's been so much political attention on the 2.1 conformity factor, that there's been a bit of a loss of fight. The boundary conditions and timing almost will be the more crucial in whether this will be effective or not. And I think mm -hmm. the death of conservation document, for me, doesn't deal with that head-on as the real sensitivity. And so really, I suppose, what, if you do 2.1 times the 80 milligrams, you get to the 168. So I think that's, you could argue, that's what you know, this, this, this regulatory scheme, if it goes through, will create. But I think there is another thing which actually could help in reducing uh, the emissions, is that there is greater variability when you do a PEMS test compared to when you do a lab test. And a manufacturer will not want to accidentally be found non-compliant when the PEMS test is perhaps rerun by by, by us or you know a regulatory agency. So they're going to have to undershoot that 168. A recent report by JRC from the EU said that maybe the measurement error is 30%. So let's say you have to aim 30% below that 168 to make sure you can't be caught out, which is 129. And that is effectively a conformity factor of 1.6 for, for diesel. So possibly, you could argue, in the positive scenario, that by that, by that statistical quirk of measurement, they have to shoot lower to make sure they don't get in legal trouble. Um, it would still mean, though, that diesels were 2.1 times more emitting in real world than gasoline cars. So there's still a gap. To, to end, um, I would I put up this plot, which looks at these are all the diesels we tested. Blue is Euro 5, red is Euro 6. And these are the, the limits. So the, the dark red is the 80 milligrams. Uh, blue is Euro 5. And then this is the step down as proposed. So the, the, the first dotted one is the 2.1 conformity factor. And the 2021 20 there is the 1.5 conformity factor. So this shows those are the honorable four that have met the 80 milligrams already. And I suppose, in summary, why I think as it's currently drafted, it's easier than it could be, is because 30% of the cars we've already tested meet the 2.1 conformity factor in real-world driving. So I, even though manufacturers have argued a lot about how tough it is, I actually think behind the scenes they'll be realizing actually it's a lot lighter than it could have been. And if a third virtually of vehicles are already meeting that 2.1 conformity factor, then maybe the manufacturers not sweating quite as hard as people think uh, they might be. Um, but that means the emissions are a lot higher, and compared to that, 
two times back during the death of consultation, there remains that dissonance. And I don't see, I, on, on many of the scenarios, 60 might not bring about that low level of emission. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, I would all finally just say, never forget the CO2 context of this. We are now seeing that the effect of all these notch reductions is to begin to have pushing CO2 higher again. So I know it's not directly air quality, but it has. It always has to be seen in the context of trading off NOx and, and fuel economy and CO2. And we, we are now beginning to see that that, um, uh, that, that trade off beginning to bite again. And that long trend of, in, of reducing CO2, we think, has ended uh, because of the focus on NOx. But maybe that's a subject for another day. So on that note, thank you very much. And, uh, Both of those talks were obviously very important, and I was keen to have that contribution because uh, the question of emission, particularly from diesel, is integral to the question of um, whether we're going to have, be able to have solutions to the problem and to improve air quality, and of course, as many of you will have spotted, um, the underlying assumptions behind the modelling in the Denver plan. So um, I'm sure we're going to come back to um, uh, this topic in the discussion. Um, now, as was observed um, earlier um, by Alan, um, local authorities are going to have to uh, play a big part uh, in the plan if um, uh, DEFRA's uh, vision comes to pass. So uh, I was very keen to have the local authority input uh, today. And uh, we um, have um, Ruth Collingwood from the City of London to provide that function. Ruth, um, now we missed being an air quality champion of the last year, I believe. So uh, next year you will be the champion, I'm sure. So yeah, Ruth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm responsible for air quality and property at the City of London Corporation, which provides local government services for the square mile. And I'm going to be giving a local authority perspective on the plans, and very specifically a central London uh, perspective, which is perhaps slightly different from uh, lots of uh, local houses coming down the country. So, as we heard, um, uh, to, to start with, actually, what I wanted to do was put um, our, our exhibition into perspective for you in terms of the concentration of nitrogen dioxide, and just how far we've got to go in the city to meet the new environment. Our busiest road sides have around about three times the new value at the moment. So, uh, Deborah said that we won't comply until 2025 everywhere. I think that's probably, if we continue as we are, and from what we've said from the about the Euro uh, 60, that's probably. <coughs> early estimate, I would think it will go beyond that if we don't do something more uh, quite substantial. I've li listed here our uh, roadside concentration, just for information. Um, the first line is TFL main tree risk, and that's a road um, that has four lanes of traffic, TFL road. Concentrations there are for the last five years. And as you can see, they've been rising um, uh, until this year when because we've got the cycle of high road work, so that completely changed the road. Um, so the whole lane traffic out, and TFL are actually holding traffic back, so we've had a lot less traffic on that road. But I think that if things are continuing, we would get another increase in MO2 levels and under my bridge. The local distributor road is one of our roads. This is just a comparison, and you can see equally mm -hmm. we've had uh, increasing con concentrations on that road. And I think this mm -hmm. is down to the direct MO2 issue that we've heard from, about from Helen and Nick, and it's a really important um, issue as a policymaker, and it's something that doesn't seem to be picked up a lot, but this direct NO2 is a real problem, and we've seen it uh, playing out in our roadside concentration. And the background side we have, we've seen reductions uh, in NO2, so in, in three or four years' time, we actually might have an area of the city that can find in the to not be next. So looking at the plans, um, as Alan said, uh, the main thing that I picked up is they are definitely clearly pushing the bond goods down to the local level using the uh, localism act as an excuse for doing that. Um, the only thing tangible really, as we've heard, is the national framework for clean air zones. Um, and also they talk about the acceleration of electrification of the fleet, but I think that's taking, um, that, that's going to go ahead anyway, our car production policies under deck. So the only thing really is the clean air zone framework. So what does that mean for us as a city? Uh, well, there's no real tangible commitment at 
all, the only rocks are already planned. The Greater London is planned just for the for activities and GLA activities that are already going there. There's nothing else in there really. Um, we are already going to have the auto emission zone for the city, um, and theoretically the limit values uh, will be going <coughs> on the clean air zone. Um, that's the case of our that will be the case. So, so even the clean air zone doesn't offer us anything within the zone. One thing I'm concerned about um, that uh, isn't covered at all is uh, if we're moving towards electrification of the fleet, where is this electricity going to be coming from? We keep hearing in the news that we're at the point um, of blackout and where there's enough electricity. Rapid charging, we're going to start with rapid charging on the street. These all take a huge amount of energy. They're going to need their own substations if we've got their bank of course. <coughs> um, and Debt is already recognising this and approaching businesses, all large buildings with standby generators, and asking them to bond the generator in times of peak electricity demand so that those buildings aren't drawing off the grid. These generators are all being more spent and very dirty, and they've entered all sorts of different heights. The Female Act hasn't allowed us to control the chimney height even on those. We have no control over these things, and I'm really concerned about that. We could be, it's a typical picture for airports. I've worked in airports for quite a few years and we see them <coughs> have these policies of the energy policies coming in and then they clash with airport policy and they seem to override uh, airport policy in time. So that's something I think we need to look out for. So all these things have formulated our response. So it, what I've done is just picked out our key points of what we would like to see as policy makers in the final plan we don't think it's been addressed. The first thing is reliable Euro standards and service. Lots of Nick and Helen about the Euro standards. As a policy maker, we need to know what's coming out of the big <coughs> office. Um, we need a commitment in some way that not uh, <coughs> emissions can be met. And also, uh, that they are going to be met for the life of the vehicle. It's no point to a vehicle out on the road for a year, then after a year, whatever device they've got to, to deal with, not how it's answered with, or there's lots of agreement about things that happen to technology and that's the year we're back to square one. So we need a commitment for an ongoing type of testing, maybe through the MOT or something like that. The MOT is known to be testable yes, <coughs> and not focusable in the air quality, like carbon and stuff, etc. Um, and again, with <coughs> the NO2, we need an NO2 limit for, for vehicles um, to assume an ever increasing amount of uh, primary NO2, which is a real problem. And we want some sort of commitment that they're going to do something about the fear commission testing. There's a commitment to break quiet on it. There's been lots of questions asked of various people, but we've not really seen anything kind of all come forward. <coughs> What's happening about that? It's okay if, if we're told that the vehicles meet standards, but if, if the manufacturers are fixing the emissions when they're on the road, then we're back to square one again. So we need something around zero standards to deliver effective policy. So, um, we also asked for additional action. Um, Desper do make reference in the plan that um, they're not quite sure about the emission factors that we use for Euro 6 and lots of uncertainties, but they're not proposing more alternatives. <coughs> if what they propose and assume doesn't happen, what's the alternative? What's, what's the plan B for it? Um, we also think that we need additional action for Central London 2025 or beyond, not as short as possible time, like 10 years from now. And as Alan said, we need financial support for those local authorities that wish to make a clean air zone. Um, they're going to be expensive, <coughs> not going to be a priority for local governments over the next few years uh, as their funding stream gets uh, cut more and more. And we want um, <coughs> additional fiscal incentives to encourage <coughs> people to purchase vehicles other than diesel. An obvious one is the collectivised duty. Whether that makes such a difference in purchase decisions, I don't know, but there's other things the government can look at because of that whole package how people are being encouraged to purchase particular vehicles. Um, and we also would like the equipment to roll out an alternative to infrastructure for the down country. So we just think it's appropriate for really for individual and also to take that on and just and then we'll touch the approach really. If we, we are going down the <coughs> electric vehicle route, we need to think strategically about where all these charge points <coughs> and how they're how they're going to work. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to touch on few things that aren't traffic related, we've been focusing on transport, but there are other sources of pollution, particularly in central London. Um, we need an updated Clean Air Act, 
as if you type approval limit not representative of real solutions before the seven times. The alternative scenario in the plan suggests that we should be five times higher than they are. And they need a very well, it's model this. I'm not sure about the model itself. Um, because it's not explained in plan. But it suggests that the third is over evaluation would be non compliant by something like this. Some of the clean air zones, you don't know all the six that have set out in the plan, how many mm -hmm. have set up their desire to implement clean air zones, how are local authorities going to fund scoping, the development, the implementation, and the management of clean air zones? Where's funding coming from? If anyone's tried to develop their quality action plans for local authorities, you see the level of negotiation and consultation that goes on just to put some signs down. The development of clean air zones is going to take a lot of that. Mm -hmm. If the local authorities decide not to implement clean air zones, then the model outputs aren't going to be representative for that area. What's plan B for addressing air pollution in that area? And if they don't take that clean air zone, will they be held accountable for national government's failure to comply with the ambient air quality directive? I don't think they can. <laughs> but the localism that suggests that there's a route that they may be able to do. So, in our opinion, national government bears responsibility for complying with the ambient air quality directive. We feel the national government needs to develop an equity plan that actually addresses the problem. Instead of especially put a model down that doesn't represent every world mission. You don't know what's going on. No well, government does need to make clear that it will support stronger planning decisions by the authority to seek to reduce or limit air pollution. And again, that's going to come with delegation of powers to do that. I know national government has to support the implementation of more stringent testing regimes. You can't really have it where <coughs> real world emissions are so vastly different from test emissions, which are then used in the model to tell us how good our air quality is. We know it's not good, it's not compliant, and we need to sort that out. In terms of the new type approval, testing procedures that have been suggested in Europe. Mm. Are they good enough, really? We've heard a lot of people aren't happy. They don't seem to reflect real world values again. So we need to develop a testing regime that does actually represent real world emissions, mm. which itself is going to be difficult. But I think that would be done to some extent. We can develop policy clarification. We want to know, in terms of the CF model, which aspects of that have been streamlined. We deal with the streamlined PTM model. We're not told how it is streamlined. If there's used any conformity factors within the plan, we have to have clarification on those. Again, the alternative scenario is something that's mentioned in the plan but not in enough detail for us. So we would like to see the data and assumptions used in calculating that alternative scenario. And how that ground has taken a survey of local authorities to see how many of them are likely to have seen their zones. Hmm. And under what circumstances, again, will local authorities bear the cost of any fines as a result of non compliance? We want that clear as day. Hmm. <laughs> right, it seems to be uh, <clears throat> final furlong now with uh, um, three speakers to go, and, uh, or, uh, or two if I choose to uh, look out. And um, so the first of those is uh, Sarah Lake, who's going to present the <laughs> 
Next up is Sarah Lake, who's going to uh, uh, present the uh, submission and views of Environmental Protection UK. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Roger. Okay. Um, hi, to all of you. Um, for those of you who don't know, Environmental Protection UK is a, a national charity that, that tries to give expert advice um, on things such as the National Crime Conversation. We have a long history of working with the IAQM as well. Um, we submitted a long uh, and robust response. I'm not planning to go through it mm. all today, and um, mm. I've got a lot of information on the slides, so that I don't have to talk about them. You can have a look later, and our entire response is online. Um, mm -hmm. Just to pick up a few points, um, obviously evidence has been talked about a lot today. We were really disappointed that they didn't publish the evidence mm -hmm. on which everything is based, because without the evidence, you can't see what they've assumed. You can't see what the scale of the problem is. You can't see how much impact mm -hmm. the measures they're talking about are going to be. I'm not going to go into clear emission factors, um, particularly because they've been covered. Um, but if there are going to be another 30 zones, or 30 zones that are non compliant, and a bigger problem in the ones they've already earned from, where were the measures? Where was plan B? Um, that is quite a big risk. Um, and just to point, just to mm. highlight that assuming that emission factors will deliver an improvement in air quality is the mistake we made in the 1990s. <coughs> we are in this situation today because we assume that the emission factors are right and didn't take any further evidence to rely purely on the Euro standards. Um, and so I don't want them to make the same mistake again because people have died. Thousands and thousands of people have died from the because of this. There's no data on the model, there's no data on primary NOT, which we've already identified. There's, um, and there was just very little information on the uncertainty. Moving on to what they're actually proposing, we were disappointed that the national plans didn't actually do any action at a national level. Um, in particular, they failed to harness the benefits that were available from existing um, government measures. Therefore, we're very keen to say that it's a whole government um, plan, but where was the refocusing of the low emission vehicle? the CFT programs into areas of um, air pollution problems. Where, the, where was the information on DEX energy and heating um, programs? Um, why was there nothing in there about treasury vehicle taxes and all the other incentives? Why was there nothing in there requiring low NOx toilets to be in building regulations? Why was there nothing stunting development control? Why was there nothing prioritizing air quality in local transport plans? This is all a massive missed opportunity. Um, there was also very little said about LAQM. There's no indication, or as far as we're aware, um, there's a big question of whether local authorities even have the right powers to effectively address their policy. Um, there's new LAQM guidance about to be consulted on. We're hoping that there'll be strong support for local authorities in that, and strong support to require development and transport planners to give more weight to air quality. Um, I've been flagged up. A lot of the air quality action plan mm -hmm. measures, um, which is all that was in the local things, are old. We wanted to see um, more information on more forward facing schemes, um, how national government will actually support the development and implementation of air quality action plans so that they can deliver more, given the current age of austerity that mm -hmm. we're working in. Mm -hmm. And then, scampering on to CAS. Um, or particularly the low emission zone elements of CAS. Um, we also <coughs> picked up on some of the terminology they use, but oh, it's easy to look at that in, in detail, um, the detailed response. Um, we wanted whether well, CAS was <coughs> workable, especially in light of the Euro standard and the BW scandal. You can see the other statement on that online as well. Um, and how government, why government were expecting low emission, uh, sorry, local authorities to implement low emission zones when they've had the opportunity to so for a decade and actually only a very few and very small or very focused ones have been mm. implemented. What's different now? Mm. Um, and we also were very skeptical that a CAS could even be operational by 2020, um, speaking from personal experience, but London low emission zones certainly took a bit longer than that. Um, 
And something, one thing I did want to pick up on, which nobody really has picked up on, um, mentioned so far, is there was no mention of non-financial support. So things like national databases. If you want a clean air zone or a low emission zone implemented sort of thing, you're going to have to have a national emission, national database for emissions and vehicles. You're going to have to have a national accreditation scheme for retrofitted vehicle equipment. You're going to have to have a national database for which vehicles are exempt. Mm -hmm. You probably want to have a common system for charging so each local authority doesn't have to invent the new software. And that can either be run locally or run mm -hmm. nationally with charging passed on to local authorities. But there was no mention in the national plans about any of that side of things. And obviously, no information mm -hmm. on financial support for local authorities is quite critical. Um, in terms of the standards, we identified that NOx was important, and obviously legally so particularly, but ignoring GM and primary NO2, is you don't get the health benefits and you could end up um, rather shooting yourself in the foot for later. And also, ideally, um, including some element of CO2 in there as well. We were supportive of the national mm -hmm. framework so long as it had enough flexibility to be tailored to local conditions. Um, so some local authorities might want to go further. Some local authorities that haven't been identified as non-compliant in the national modelling might want to go further or might want to implement things. Um, and we want to give them the flexibility to implement things in the best way possible. Mm. If it is only based on your growth standards or, as Helen identified, the emission standards, emission levels <coughs> are equivalent and therefore assumedly, assuming they're based on the same test cycles, then these must be proven. There are also issues about implementation, getting people using, misusing the equipment, emissions abatement equipment, and variables, um, which I won't cover right now. We also identified some other things that we thought should be included in the non LED bit of TAS, um, which picks up on a few of the points Ruth made. Um, uh, and also the Clean Air Alliance which EPUK um, is playing a large part in, have identified some of the priorities they were um, coming out of the environmental audit. <coughs> and that um, is, I've just listed them there for you. Um, and let me know if you'd like to know any more about that. So, hopefully, I have mm -hmm. run through some of the key points while taking not too much of your time. Um, mm -hmm. I won't tell you what I've just told you. Um, and don't forget to have an annual conference next week in Birmingham if you'd like to come. And both the full response, the letter we sent separate about asking for ev evidence and our statements on the CW scandal are all online at our website. Thank you.
There is reference to this so-called UK, UK technical report that's going to follow. It's only going to come out at the time of the final plan. It's something it is, so of course we can't see it. And I'm sure amongst many people in this room, all their college professionals, the one thing you want to do is look at the evidence base for it. And there are things hidden in there, you just don't quite know what they've done. Um, what the, I don't know if people have touched on is the projections for future years are now very different and much lower than those that were previously submitted. It's stated, I think, that this is driven primarily by the um, use of COPA's version 11 emissions factors, uh, but from what I've read, I find it quite hard to understand precisely what they've done. And it's also not clear to me were there any other changes put in there, um, are there revisions to the future fleet forecasts done in there, the vehicle fleet turnover, which would affect things as well. We don't know what they've done to it, it just doesn't seem to be published. And if you do a little comparison, I try to get the best way of showing this, if you look at the projections for 2020, and the ones in the left-hand columns are what we were submitted last year, compared to what we've got in there, there really are dramatic reductions in vehicle kilometres exceeding in, in London, going down from 350 to 40 kilometres. Uh, places like Greater Manchester now complying where it wasn't complying before. They really are substantial changes. I'm not implying they're wrong, it's just that you can't see exactly what they've done. So it makes it very difficult to comment on it. Of the proposed measures, people have actually said this before, national plans seem to have almost nothing that's new in there. Um, and a lot of the actions that are cited from other <coughs> departments are really being carried out for other reasons. They're already in place, I think service mentioned it. Um, the work they're all there to do on ultra low emission vehicles, I, I fully support. I, I, I um, accept that if that goes forward, it would be beneficial for our quality. I think the issue is, though, that the measure was set out to drive climate change. Has somebody gone back to see whether we can optimise what we're doing to deliver and improve their quality in the shortest time period? And I think the answer is no. There's been no engagement on that, and no, no attempt to try and optimise what we're doing to get the benefit in the shortest time. Uh, second point on those reference made to the use role of land use planning, something incredibly dear to my heart. Um, as many people will know, in April of this year, um, EP UK and IHUM published a, a guidance note on, on planning and, and air quality. During the course of doing that, we tried to engage with DEFRA on this topic. We wrote to them, we went to see them, we wrote to them again, and we asked them what is the role of development control in trying to achieve compliance with the limit values, to which we got no answer whatsoever. And what's in the planning policy framework and planning practice guidance it's very weak, it's ambiguous, it's vague, it doesn't tell you what to do or how to do it, and at the moment, very little recognition is taken of limit values and development control, and it probably won't change until they actually try to do something about it. On the um, local plans, I must confess I only read the one for Greater London, but there are obviously the laundry zone and agglomeration. In the back of these, the enormous appendices setting out extensive lists of measures that are in local authority air quality action plans. But for someone that looked at, those are very old. I think some of them are probably obsolete. The measures were planned, have never been put into place or have been put into place. And the evidence is to date, most of them are delivered very little real improvement. So I can't quite understand the point of really at this whole list of historical things that either have been put into place and have been done or have never worked and never will work. Why, why are they in there? <laughs> um, it's had to slide aside, but it's a forthcoming LHM consultation. Um, is going to come up. We really want to see them address this. We need a strengthened system, clear guidance on what local authorities' responsibilities are, how can they drive measures forward, and what are the other tiers of governments and other organisations going to do. Uh, we've gone to the CAS in, in terms of the new measures, that's probably about the only thing that's there. Uh, there's no obligations to do it. Uh, there's little information on what they think the CAD is beyond the MLEZ. I think they talk about things like planning, parking controls might be introduced, but it isn't really clarified as what they mean. Uh, there's no funding mechanism there. Um, it's been mentioned before that with the framework in place, why would the local authority find it desirable to, to do it? There's no political will there. The implementation costs will be high. And the, the time scale is really quite important. That once you start to go beyond 2020, the benefits you start to get become less and less. So <coughs> it has to be done quickly, a five year time scale, or probably less four years, to try and get these things in place really is quite, I think, probably pushing it a little bit. There is one other issue on this, which is a bit of a side, because there is this huge disparity between locations where 
data shows the exceed is the limit value, and where local authorities have got exceedances of, of the objectives. Uh, that is a good example. Local authority measures quite high concentration, the data say no problem there. Um, if these data plans are obviously focused on compliance with the limit value, but the health terms, it doesn't matter if, it, if there's an exceedance of the objective, you probably just recognise the difference between the objective and the limit value. So, will I have the option for local authorities to improve their quality? Outside those areas where the national model doesn't indicate a problem. I'm just concerned that I know why the focus will be on achieving compliance with the limit value, but if we've got exceedances that aren't recognised by DEFRA, it's important we don't take our eye off the ball and just start to ignore those as we go forward. Uh, people have mentioned the, the sensitivity test that's included in there. It's supposed to address the one of the forms of Euro 6. I think they've assumed the conformity factor of 5 in, in the plan as opposed to um, 2.5, which is in COPA 11. And what it did, what I think Sarah mentioned before, that the test shows you get an additional 22 zones or agglomerations who will be non compliant by 2020. What it doesn't, though, point out is the scale of the problem in those other eight non compliant zones or agglomerations are going to be exacerbated. So they're going to be not only get another 22, but the eight you've already got, the problem is going to be worse. And the change isn't stated. It doesn't say anywhere what that's going to be. And as we said before, there's no indication at all what additional measures would be required under that scenario. So if that happens, then what happens? Nothing is set out as to what, what would be done. Uh, just take a look at the bit. We know the Environment and Water Committee has now investigated this three times, I think, and the number of recommendations that just seem to have been completely ignored again on goals and timescales to rebalance fuel duty and vehicle excise duty to move the shift away from diesel hasn't been addressed. Um, the plan sort of talks about, um, uh, they talked about the um, reissuing the, the planning policy framework guidance to make it clear. I've addressed that before, but again, they've really not taken it up. Um, they talk about um, non-road mobile machinery emissions, and they talk about things that might come from Europe, and they talk about things in Greater London, but no measures to try and roll out something nationally to try and reduce emissions within that sector. And I think um, uh, Rick, I've touched on this before about the National um, Public Awareness Campaign. Again, in that report we produced for decade many years ago, we said there should be a national framework on consultation. Rather than local authorities reinventing it all the time, couldn't they produce something that could be taken out and rolled out to try and push forward an understanding, public intervention, public awareness? Again, it's been uh, completely ignored. So, concluding remarks then, um, draft plans are very little bit new in there. The evidence on um, clean air zones is unsatisfactory in terms of uptake and efficacy. I get the view that although other government departments have signed it off, they've got very little input into it, they've signed it off basically because that was what was there before. And I think this is just seen as a separate problem to, for them to sort out with nothing additional coming forward for it. And of course we've got the recently announced agreement on first percent spending cuts over the next four years, which is really going to help try and provide some funding or support at all. The problem is trying to drive it forward. It's got a lot of difficult choices with this. And I think history tells us that you get such improvements through very strong regulation or very strong fiscal changes. Um, some examples might be we managed to get lead out of petrol. There was a lot of complaining before that happened. People said cars wouldn't work, refineries couldn't produce it. It did happen because of very strong regulation. Lead in air concentrations plummeted overnight. We were successful. We, if it's good to happen, there has to be very strong regulation. Fiscal changes, an example might be Norway, who make only a standard fuels um, car so expensive. There's been a massive shift towards take-up of electrical vehicles. Can you make it so that members of the public make a demand change? The problem is it's going to be very unpopular with businesses or the general public or will incur government expenditure, and I feel that at the moment no one's particularly got the stomach to do it. I was going to put a final bullet point on there whether Brexit was the answer, but um, <laughs> let's hope not. <laughs> Um, all the previous speakers have uh, addressed all the points that I would have made um, had I, now, had I uh, proposed to spend the next five, ten minutes uh, explaining what we put in our submission, so I won't do that. Um, just to uh, echo the points that I said, I think uh, <coughs> IQM would uh, 
uh, would say that uh, these plants do not meet the requirements. Um, uh, they are quite good in diagnosing the main problem for roadside concentrations, namely the, uh, the role of the diesel engine, but they, uh, they don't seem to be any really strong solutions towards addressing the problem. Um, second as a whole, the plants are rather voluminous with all the action plants, so most of them contain what might uh, be described as pure fluff, um, and nothing really um, of any substance beyond the steep point there, recycling of old, uh, old measures. Uh, we too don't think this is a, a genuine cross government report, and uh, Treasury is conspicuous by its absence in terms of involvement, I think, and um, they uh, really had any real role in it. So, Without uh, some intervention at the national level, it's very hard to see um, how we can impress uh, the Commission and the Supreme Court. Um, so, we now come to uh, the uh, discussion phase of this uh, meeting. Uh, if I could ask all the speakers to uh, take uh, the uh, platform here, if they wish. If they wish to remain as they are, that's fine. Um, but we would like to, we would like to, uh, we do need to pick this up. And um, I haven't forgotten those of you um, on the phone listening in. We'll try and allow you to make a contribution. I hope you can hear the um, questions as they, uh, they arise. So, there must be lots of people willing to say, you can stay there, Nick, if you don't want to be on your own. <laughs> I'll say that myself. Um, right, okay, we would like to ask the first question, either generally or one of our speakers. Alan Mackin. Alan Mackin, sir, from Amex, Dr. Wheeler. Um, well, I've got, oh, I've got so many questions, I'm actually. Is, is this switched on, by any chance? Good. I've got so many questions I'd like to ask, but I'm going to limit myself to one, which is uh, Alan Andrews, in fact. Um, and it, I suppose it's all, it would be unreasonable and indeed probably unethical uh, for me to ask you to second guess or predict the outcome of any future legal action in courts. But um, I suppose it really comes down to what's your view on the level of power that the courts actually will have in the future to force the government, because at the end of the day it's about money, eventually the solution to the problem. What power will the courts have in your view to force the government to allocate funds to address this problem? Um, traditionally, the courts have got a fairly limited range of, of remedies that they can give. Um, but what gives us real cause for optimism is the, the approach that both the European Court and Supreme Court took, which was really uh, showing a, a willingness to take more drastic measures against the government than they normally would. And I think the longer we see government intransigence, I think the more we will see uh, the courts react to that by imposing ever more stringent uh, remedies. Um, one of the main things that the European Court and Supreme Court envisaged was a much, uh, much more involved role for the courts in really analysing the substance of the air quality plans, which they normally are, are very reluctant to do. I think we're, if this goes back to court, I think the Administrative Court will have to take a, a much more involved look at the content of the air quality plans, and based on what we've heard from our, our speakers today, I, they can't help but draw the conclusion that the government is not achieving compliance in the shortest time possible, and I think they will be forced to provide some pretty drastic remedies. Next contribution. Bernard Fisher. Just wait for the microphone, Bernard, so we can next see your question. I was thinking about a get out of jail card to people, and I, am I right in thinking 2020 there's going to be a revision of the ambient air quality directive, and if the UK is still in Europe, as Steve says, won't this bring in considerations of other things besides NO2, such as uh, PM2.5 PM um, limit values, and uh, won't the final limit values be subject to a, a lot of lobbying? from various powerful groups, such as um, motor manufacturers. Well, maybe, but it's very unlikely to see the uh, 40 micrograms cubic meter for NA2 going up, is it not? Well, the value was set many, many years ago, um, and so um, 
Yeah, well, okay, but uh, you can, there, there'll be some discussion, presumably either in public or behind closed doors on proportionality. And, um, well, even in my more cynical moments, I can't believe the uh, Commission would propose shifting a 40. No, but it, it could quite easily allow for higher extensions or yeah. downgrade the limit value from a, a binding limit value to a target value. Uh, I think that's the very reason that the Commission didn't. Uh, revise the ambient air quality directive as it was supposed to in 2013. Yeah. I think they would be mad to open it up in 2020 if we are still in the same situation. Mm. Um, they're not daft. But they won't do it if they think that they're going to be under pressure to, to downgrade the energy limit value. Yeah. Well, interesting call. Um, Ruth. Mm. Can I just add to that? Um, from a local government perspective, we've all Responsibilities of improving public health under the Health and Social Care Act 2012, and there is a, a particular requirement to reduce the impact of air pollution on health. So even if the limit values disappear, or something happens to them, it's not the end of the road in terms of what we can do as organisations mm -hmm. to take action to improve air quality and reduce exposure. Yes, that's perfectly true. Uh, <laughs> even in a world where the uh, NO2 uh, concentration was, say, 39 at maximum, we still have um, a health burden. So very much worth bearing in mind. Um, <coughs> right, uh, in the absence of a hand up, could I ask if anyone's A, still listening on the phone, and B, wishes to make a uh, contribution? All gone away. Okay, back to the audience here. Do that. Uh, Robert, you're nearest to mm -hmm. there. Oh, that's Christine, yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Christine McHugh, Amit Foster Wheeler. Um, I just want to make a comment sort of on the local government um, scene. Um, so, if you've been following the national news, you know, each day there's a new scandal oh, local government isn't funding XYZ, today it's mental health. You know, <coughs> and there was the letter between David Cameron and the leader of Oxford, uh, County, Oxford County Council. And I think. I mean, I'm quite involved with a council where I live, and the, you know, the uh, cuts are very, very savage, and not not just cuts in money, which constrain what local authorities can do, but the changes to power. So, for instance, the government um, <coughs> has, um, in terms of planning, you can change offices to housing without planning permission, and. So, and that's got all sorts of knock-on effects, you know, where, where are bus stops, where are the schools, this type of thing. And um, in March of this year, the government also said, here are our national minimum regulations for buildings, and you cannot have local standards that are tougher. That sort of government is not going to give local authorities more power to control local, to control air quality through the planning regime, unless they are actually fine. I wish to respond to that. Okay, in that case, we'll take a um, question from Peter. Peter Fleming, TRL. I just wanted to ask Nick, actually. Um, obviously, the one thing that hasn't come up is driving style. Um, obviously, has a significant effect, and uh, I've always wondered whether certain vehicles would probably have higher emissions, not because of the vehicle, but because of the way they're driven. Um, I know we have these figures, but perhaps if you can bring them out at the moment, is to give us some idea of the difference between the emissions from a car doing its standard 0 to 60 acceleration test that all, the, all, all manufacturers do, compared to what it's emitting at, at a nice steady 50 miles per hour. Because obviously this has uh, the one thing that's never really been looked at enough is the amount of the effect of stop-start putting in traffic lights and people accelerating away and stopping and accelerating away and stopping. Thanks very much. Uh, it's an ex extremely good question. I, 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 firstly, I should say the data I put up was based upon very normal driving. So not aggressive acceleration, you know, very typical speeds and accelerations. Um, but there is a, in a dramatic difference between you know, a steady state of 50 on a, on, a, on a diesel car, the level of NOx coming out would be extremely low. Um, 
pretty much all the NOx is produced either accelerating or going up a hill. So the introduction of traffic, traffic measures, uh, bus lanes, or whatever, that, that can interrupt the smooth flow of traffic in some way will be a significant contributor to NOx. But then you have to, the interaction then with the after treatment system is important. The, the SCR after treatment systems can be much more tolerant to, to cleaning up those spikes of NOx. Whereas LNT systems, which tend to be you know, good at low load, will then have breakthrough you know, as soon as the load is higher. So you have to, it's a very complex area, the interaction of you know, the, the, the traffic flow with the technology installed on the vehicle um, as to what the outcome is. I think actually in the medium term, we will move towards vehicles which are, have SCR and LNT co-installed. Uh, I mean, that at BMW now does that on all their vehicles in the US. And I think that will be uh, the combination of the two addresses, SCR's problem in cold start and LNT's problem of rates through a higher load. Uh, and so that, that will solve that. Um, and, and maybe then that will diminish the spikiness of NOx and, and the effective NOx cost of any traffic uh, uh, road engineering that leads to more stop start. <laughs> We have a lot more hands going all over the place. Uh, for no good reason, let me start with the back because Robert's there with the microphone. Hi, just off the back of what, oh, sorry, Rosalind Edrisco, Imperial College. Off the back of what Nick just said, and also something he said to me the other week. So you're saying BMW use this in America, but not in Europe. So why do the European Union accept like lower standards than the US? Like if it's working in America, why can't we just emulate that instead of reinventing the wheel? Why? Because the manufacturers tell us, oh, we can't do it, and then we go, oh, okay, but we can see it working in the states. They're selling different cars. The same manufacturers are selling better cars. Does anyone know why that's allowed? <laughs> <laughs> do you have a comment on that, Nick? Well, I mean, it's a very good, I mean, I've said all along to the European regulators, if you want a quick and easy way to cut to a good end answer, just go and emulate what happens in the U.S. Is the U.S. market very small for diesel? Only one percent or something. It's a very, it's a very small market. I think. Yes, but nevertheless, it just be, one can judge the effectiveness of the regulation, even though it's, diesel has a small penetration. Um, mm. For the point of view, what does the real world emission from those diesel cars do compared to the official level? We can see a, a regulatory system in the US which is much more effective than here, so the actual market share is, is, is not directly relevant. And no uh, that. I don't understand why. No, no, absolutely. I, just, I, mean, I think it's not politics, pure politics. And, and in a way, my view is that Europe has decided politically it leapfrogs the US by introducing the real world on road validation of it, which the US isn't doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's, uh, positions Europe politically as supposedly at the cutting edge of. Um, and done right, it would. Done bad, it would. Hmm. <laughs> well, lots of people want to make a contribution over here, but do we have any specific follow-up to this point before we move on? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think it's a bit ironic to say go the US way when in fact it's in the US where VW have been basically using the defeat devices and in Europe they haven't. Um, well, do you have evidence for that? Well, I've got a letter about my car saying it's got to be changed. <laughs> 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 it's not the same as saying they've been using a defeat device, is it? Is that the same as saying they've been using well, a defeat device? Change, uh, yeah, but my question to you is have they used a defeat device? Well, they measure it before, they measure it after and check. But you're, you don't have a response to that point. The, the, the thing I would like to say, though, is um, with regard to the, the comments about the, the consultation having diagnosed the problem, I'm surprised that in your work you're not looking at the public transport elements because, for example, in the published data in the, in the consultation, where they give the source of apportionment for the concentrations they're modeling, in the vast majority of links, particularly the high ones, the, the bus contribution is two or three times the contribution of the car contribution. And so I just wonder, is there any work going on in your world to look at the PMs output of the public transport vehicles, and do you think that was adequately addressed in this consultation? Thank you. Yeah, we, we do do testing of, of buses. Um, 
from a particular point of view, a retrofitting uh, after treatment is primarily around NOx reduction, but um, also PM reduction. So we, we do do that. What we don't do is in the same systematic way um, yeah. where you've got um, mm -hmm. vehicles of a standard production format that you can then compare to one another. But yes, we do we do, do that sort of testing, even though I didn't uh, produce it today. What's interesting from a bus point of view, though, is in my advice, it's not so much about the bus itself, it's about the knock-on impact the bus has on the traffic, the passenger car traffic flow, and where the bus is creating knock-on mm -hmm. perturbations in the traffic flow, then map that to the knock spikes you see in, 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 those, uh, in, 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 in those events. That's actually where there's a magnifier effect. Mm -hmm. um, so both, both things need to be looked at. We haven't done enough bus testing to have a view on that. No, I mean, the, the other comment I'd like to make is the comments that I share, the comments that other people said, I, I think it's ridiculous to run a consultation of this nature and not provide the technical report to the same partners for a consultation which I'm waiting in the dark. So, I'm like, yeah. I mean, can, if I may, I, just, I mean, your previous comments about the US system versus the European system, um, the other comment I'll make is it's interesting that VW you know, is called cheating in the US. It, it might be. It, that is the only way to manipulate your emissions in the US by actually breaking the law. Is the European regulation system has so, you know, so many laxities in it, you can get, you can uh, optimise to it adequately within the law. So it's actually a measure of success of the US system that we have been called action breaking it. Well, I'd like to come back to you on that, actually. <laughs> 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 Let's move on. Uh, before we go, I just comment that I've been asking quite a lot about what the TFL doing his work. A year I think, of course, is actually quite good, and it's a very good target to measure. Um, but moving on, David on front row. Yeah, just a quick, it was just a quick uh, interjection. Uh, I hope you'd like to move on, David. A quick interjection on, on, on that with bus perturbation, because as, certainly in Bristol, as part of the uh, bus, bus prioritisation programme, they introduced these bus stops that, that protrude into the road so that, uh, so that when a bus pulls up, you get a big uh, queue of traffic behind it, and it actually increases the the problem of of, the, of that uh, perturbation, and that that may be something that uh, ought to be considered. Right. Anyone not want to talk about buses, please? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about buses, but I do want to talk about real world emissions. Um, for a long time, I was on a research committee of the FT, a cleaner vehicle and fuel research committee, and we um, discussed the Department for Transport's research program and priorities. And at that time, I always said the priority was for the FT to do in-service testing of vehicles, and that anything else had to come second. As far as I know, they don't do that program anymore. And it seems to me that maybe the regulations in Europe should change, requiring the type approval authorities or governments to actually undertake real-world driving tests themselves, so independently of the motor manufacturers, because I remain concerned that the manufacturers will possibly select the data that they present. Um, I don't know what they might do, but they obviously are going to present data that is of benefic benefit to them, and I just feel there needs to be an independent body who's doing the test. Um, sorry, there's a lady at the back there. Uh, then we've got a hand up quite a while. Thanks, Robert. Um, Xiang Yixuan from Capita. Um, I probably just have a, a question, really, a more general question to the audience here of Officer Roger. Um, we can sense that there are drug action plans, um, particularly the clean air zones, doesn't sound going to work, uh, given all the constraints and everything else. Perhaps we could just think, um, if we jump out of a box, what can make it work, really? Is there any options there, anything people can do or government can do? Assuming, for example, if the um, uh, funding is actually available, assuming, okay, that's a presumption, <laughs> which may not happen, what kind of drastic measure actually can really make um, those areas currently can't meet the limit values to become compliant. What kind of draft measures can be done? Thinking half the car zone, no car zones, 
30% carbon or something, you know, some inspiration, something to help us think what can work. We, we discuss a lot of the, I guess, I guess, I understand that um, in this real world, um, not, not many options of policy could work, but what can work, my question is. Well, that rather depends how aggressive mm -hmm. the government wants to be and how much it's willing to um, uh, fund such things. So, you know, you might, for example, <coughs> uh, propose um, a diesel scrappage scheme, um, which would take the offending Euro 5 off the, off the road. One of the things that struck me about Nick's slide was that um, not just the focus on, on Euro 6 uh, and so on, but um, uh, how the dots on the scatter plot for Euro 5 were enormous compared to Euro 6. Um, so you could do that, you could have targeted um, bus um, uh, uh, replacement programs, for example. So um, that would be the kind of measure. But all of those require a lot of ambition um, and certainly a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, it, it really depends on your, the scale of your ambition. Uh, and that's where I think the plans fail, really, because they uh, expect too much of local authorities on, uh, on, on the shoe string. So, you know, uh, if you want to solve a problem on the time scale, in, uh, or the shortest possible time, you've really got to be quite bold and ambitious. Um, that's just my view, though. Um, would anyone else like to um, offer an opinion? Um, well, actually, then I'll take the opportunity to ask a question of um, Alan. Um, as a person who spent a lot of time in, the, in and around the Commission in Brussels, um, what do you think the Commission's view is going to be of the, uh, of the plans? <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Don't be distracted. <laughs> Look, I, I, I don't think they're uh, going to be very impressed at all. Um, they, um, we, we, we'll be discussing the plans with them. We will be forwarding on the, the, the best and most relevant consultation responses for them for them to look at. Um, I think certainly at the technical level of the Commission, they'll be very unimpressed and very keen to progress with action against the UK. But the problem with the Commission infringement process is it is inherently political. Mm. Um, so there are various ways in which uh, things can be delayed, mm. uh, particularly in a, uh, at a time when we're approaching uh, potential Brexit and a, a referendum, yeah. um, it might not be seen as politically wise to be taking action against the UK. Mm. So well, we'll see. So I, I, I think if, if I was in DEFRA's shoes or, or, or anyone else in the government, I'd be more concerned about national legal action than, than the European Commission at this stage. Yeah. 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 Well, absolutely. I mean, we, as individuals or as an, an NGO, we don't have the right to go to the European Court and challenge the European institutions for, for their failures. That's a, a huge gap in, in the sort of access to justice conditions and a, a big part of the problem. Absolutely. Yeah, hi. Is it working? Anyway, uh, it's kind of a question for Helen, I think, which is really about the issue of the growing fraction of NO2 in the NOx emissions group. So, I mean, essentially, you're getting up to 70 or 80 percent, or even higher. That's a fairly powerful statement to do with all their emitting pure toxins as opposed to cocktail toxins. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... Um, it's, 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 it's I thought, it's, I thought not, maybe you should hear a little bit more on that, because it's quite a powerful well, important statement. It's not just um, next data. I mean, remote sensing data shows the same thing. You know, with the NO2 to NOx ratio being very much higher for new diesel. Um, and I've been trying to talk to the people that understand the chemistry of the SCR and the, the other things. Um, it does seem that at very high NO2 levels, the SCR may be less effective. There's quite a lot that I think needs to be looked at. Um, Johnson Matty and some of these other bodies will have a lot more knowledge on this. 
But I think we need to go into it much more in why these high NO2 levels are happening and what could possibly be done to reduce it. It may not be easy. Very much one point, if you're measuring NOx, fraction of NO2 is totally variable, then the value of NOx is much reduced. Mm -hmm. Especially the way of expressing it to politicians and possibly yeah. even journalists. Yeah, well, I was trying to explain this to the MP the other day. He mm -hmm. said the difficulty is not finding solutions but understanding problems. And mm -hmm. I think we've got a big gap there. Well, I'll just say one other quick thing as well. <coughs> Did you check in in the COPA changes, in other words, the revised COPA emission yeah. um, factors? Did you ever ask them to the sample site on which they were based? No, but I have one comment, I mean, obviously they take as much data as they, they can, they've got um, a lot of tense data, they've got a lot of data, data, but one of the comments is why have the latest assessment improved with taking COPA 4.7 instead of 4.10? And COPA has changed the fraction that it's receiving the primary NO2 from 50% to 30%, and it's responsible for quite a lot of that importance. <coughs> So can I can just answer my own question. I did, I did actually ask what the sample size was. And the year of five cards, the total sample, but according to the Institute of Technology at Grad, which I think was together, mm -hmm. was 80 year of five cards, of which 20 were uh, diesel. And um, the year of six, it was 20 cards in total, of which five were diesel. So those initial factors, which have been used to say national policy, NO2. Am I right in thinking that um, there's supposed to be an emission standard for primary NO2 emissions coming from Europe as well? And Not that what I know of. I thought there was some discussions underway that that was intended or it was going to happen, and if it was going to happen, it would be seems to be sensible. It was progressed fairly quickly as the, te as the technology is coming forward to address Euro 6C and how you use it. If there's going to be a control on primary NO2, it would be good if it was. I'm a friend of the Earth Air Pollution person. 
Um, and uh, first, before I forget, can the slides be made available? Uh, well, it's our policy. Normally, yes. we put them on the website, so I think, yes, unless Great. any individual speaker would tell us that. Well, to restrict that. Um, and I had two points, one of which follows directly, actually, now from, from what was just said about all possible measures, because um, some of the planning, the NPF has mentioned, um, mm -hmm. PPG, but also the National Network's NPS. Is, is really, um, you know, in our view, rather dodgy. Um, it seems to um, have formed the, the sort of Heathrow argument, um, which is, you know, that only, only sort of delaying <coughs> compliance uh, matters. And that certainly, you know, Heathrow is hiding under the fact that somewhere else would be worse, therefore it's okay to, to, to add to the problem in our area. Um, and uh, that's seen elsewhere, I think, already. So certainly, um, you know, you know, we think that it, it needs to be not only not delaying, but not worsening. And indeed, because of the sort of special measures we're under, um, if you've got a, a plan, a scheme that would actually um, add to the problem, and then plans uh, are supposed to be mitigated by other measures, then surely the, the, there should be the mitigation should be done anyway, anything that is appropriate or could be done, but not the scheme which was designed you know, for, for, in the first place. So, you know, that, that's certainly what, what uh, it seems to be a logical um, extension of, of what's needed. Otherwise, one is deliberately adding to the problem. Um, so that's certainly one, one, one point be interesting to see what people think. And the other is, um, you know, on the, on the real-world testing and, and that sort of thing, Surely, the, ultimately, it's in the manufacturers and the car owners um, this benefit because the, the worse that actual vehicles are, the more we're going to have to restrict or ban them, ultimately, because the ambient air um, you know, limits still apply. So, um, you know, we're just going to have to, to use them, buy them less, use them less. Thanks. Thanks for the contribution. Yes, I think on the first point, with regard to the planning, um, my own view is that... Um, we aren't really going to resolve this until we have something properly tested um, in a court. Um, there are opinions, legal opinions on, on the matter, but uh, some of them are in conflict. Uh, and certainly the um, uh, relevant government departments seem to be um, a bit uh, vague on this topic. So uh, I agree in these um, resolution. Um, yes, did you want to make another point, please? Going back to learning from the Americans, which I know is not very popular in some parts of Europe, um, I believe that in the States, the equivalent of the MOT, your car actually goes on a proper chassis dynamometer for a proper emissions test rather than the version that we have over the, in the UK. I'm just asking whether anybody knows whether this is actually the case. I just need it confirmed. And if that is the case, could you see that being brought in in the UK, bearing in mind that motorists would actually have to pay for it themselves? Well, I'd like to offer an informed opinion, so you're shaking your head. Well, I don't think it's in the auto world program, all those years ago, in the 1990s, whether or not there should be a more stringent MOT by the European Union, those words that just have to be used in their terminology. Um, and they are just so expensive, I can't think that it would ever be politically acceptable. Um, I might be wrong, but... It's a shame, but money always keeps. Yes, it is. And I can, I can have a look at it if it would be helpful. I mean, I'm not, it's not my absolute special subject, but my understanding is it differs hugely from state to state. Approximately half of the U.S. states, I believe, have no equivalent of the MSC whatsoever. Here, for example, Michigan, uh, appropriately enough. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, that's why you keep in turn that the states where there's lots of old cars are bits hanging off this, uh, driving around. You know, it, because there's no, there is no equivalent whatsoever. Then you go to the other extreme, California. But even there, I, I, I mean, I've not heard that there's actually a full chassis dyno test, and there's different degrees of smog tests, but mostly which are just some variants on opacity uh, tailpipe tests. I, I'm not aware of any that have you know, full, proper chassis dyno tests with high-grade uh, emissions equipment. I mean, I might, I might be wrong, but, uh, but. But half of them, anyway, have nothing whatsoever. Yeah, Sarah. So, um, I'm just going to add to that because, I, mm. I mean, if we're looking at emission zones, then, then actually there's been some evidence that in, in some of the cases in the UK and elsewhere, that actually people 
get their accreditation and then take the kit off. Or they run the emissions abatement equipment without the reagent, which is worse than you know running it running it without any of it. Um, so even to, you would even even if you didn't go as far as the chassis dynamometer, you would need to have a system that was adequate to assess whether the vehicle was meeting the conditions. Does it have the bit of kit it says it's supposed to have? Is it being used with the reagents? And there are software um, options for for checking that it's not being run about. Um, and is the vehicle of a sufficient standard and being sufficiently maintained for that bit of emission abatement equipment, equipment to be adequate to work on that particular car? Um, when, when we looked at taxis, there was an awful lot of taxis that just weren't good enough for the bit of kit to work. So you could put on this 5,000 piece of um, 5,000 pound retrofit but it wouldn't work because the taxi itself was in such poor condition. So, I mean, there's, there's other issues that you would need to look at if you were going down an early dead route as well. I think the Department of Transport is proposing to tighten up the MOT test here, which will, I think it's involving an inspection to make sure the DPS filter hasn't been taken off. And I guess that could probably be logically be extended to make sure a urea tank hasn't been removed or disconnected. So that's having to be a relatively quick and easy solution. And the next level, I, mean, I think it would be inevitable that the car will have some sort of protective mode that if, if, you, if the urea tank is run dry, the car will go into, into a protective mode um, to essentially make it, well, short of cutting and shutting the car down, making a strong incentive to the user to, to top it up again. I, I think uh, inevitably that will have to be in the use. Okay. So, mm -hmm. are we coming to... Oh? I'll just go on my final one, just start piggybacking on that last uh, response from Nick. Um, mm -hmm. I can actually say so, I don't need the microphone. Um, so a colleague of mine has a very recently acquired Audi A6 that had the urea tank. If the urea tank came to it, then it, it automatically cuts back into loop home mode straight away. And that's the latest thing, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've got a question. Come on, John. Uh, the lady from the city of London. Right, yeah. Right behind. Do I need a microphone? Yeah, so one of your slides. It didn't work. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. Um, <laughs> one, one, of your, one of your slides basically showed, uh, or it said, uh, something about a shortage of electricity supply mm -hmm. for the electrification of transport. I, I just wonder what you meant by that. Do you mean that we can't get clean power or we can't get enough power? Right. Um, it's, it's something that um, I'm concerned about going forward um, because it's covered in the news quite a lot at the moment that we're at the point of potentially having blackouts. Um, there's a bit of panic going on about what would happen. The government don't want that to happen. So what DEC has been doing is approaching big um, <coughs> businesses, hospitals and places with generators and already getting them to run the generator for their own electricity supply in terms of feed time. So that's already happening. That's without all the, the electrification of the fleet uh, in London. Uh, TfL have got plans to roll out rapid charging infrastructure for zero emission capable taxis in central London. They are all going to need quite a substantial electricity supply. I'm just thinking where is that going to come from? Are we going to see more generators running Apply the electricity locally for buildings whilst we're charging up an electric vehicle next door. That's, that's something that we don't see. I've applied for some funding to try and look at this, look at the scale of the potential problem. The problem with generators on buildings is we don't know how many there are, we don't know where they are, we don't know how big they are, we don't know how old they are, we don't know where they emit, some of them emit into car parks, some of them emit at uh, head height. Um, we, we just don't know. These things are only run uh, at the moment for testing purposes and if there's a power outage. Because we don't get many of those, we don't tend to see them. But when they start up, they do belch out a lot of black smoke um, and they are a bit cleaner, but they are going to have quite high levels of particles and NOx just because of the nature of the kit. So it's something that I'm hoping to do a piece of work looking into it. Um, and we'll have more answers on um, whether it's going to be a problem, the same problem, hopefully, <coughs> um, in the next sort of year or so. Yes, I mean, there is um, a, a, a proper deck policy on short-term operating reserves, um, 
which doing a look at uh, boosting out of the grid um, at times of big demand. And the solution to short <coughs> operating reserves is guess what? Um, diesel farms. So you actually have a whole bunch of diesel engines acting in unison to put extra uh, electricity into the grid um, <coughs> in the early evening peak, for example, when uh, everyone's. Um, a lot of them sold on solar farms. Sorry? A lot of solar farms were sold in diesel farms to back up to run. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is the short term <laughs> solution. Um, but there is also um, the problem that you referred to um, about can we get sufficient um, uh, energy, electricity rather, of any kind uh, into the grid for cars. Because, and that's a recognised problem that uh, OLED is uh, addressing or at least examining. Um, at the moment, we have um, sort of two, three percent of uh, sales uh, <coughs> new cars being electric vehicles. But uh, in the not too distant future, if that continues to increase, then we have a genuine mm -hmm. problem um, having a, um, enough grid capacity uh, compared to the present one, uh, and the timing of that too. If everyone <coughs> uh, comes back from uh, home in the evening, clogs in uh, at the same time, then. We don't have enough um, uh, grid capacity, and there are localized problems um, if you would want to install charges. And the problem is that the last person in the queue for it has to pay for, an, say, the substation upgrade. So you might be looking at 30,000 pounds to have a new substation uh, 100 yards down the road, so you can have a rapid charging point. So there are some serious problems there that uh, need addressing. How do you run out of steam? I thought, no from, uh, I've got one other thing to say. <laughs> Go on then, say it now. You have the floor. I worked, I worked for some time for those who don't know. Um, if you remember, this debate really took off with the Volkswagen uh, revelations. And the key difference about VW was simply that it was the name of the manufacturer that we could actually put to the whole issue. And um, we, had, we had run a series of articles before with Nick's help and named cars and named car manufacturers and try to identify where the problem is coming from. But in the past, a lot of researchers have produced really good research on co collating data from thousands of cars with no names. And that's one of the key reasons why all this stays in the background and never really got much attention. So it's a plea, really, for any of you who are undertaking research in the future uh, or come across any kind of issue, mm -hmm. Name, name the, there's no problem. You're not going to run into problems if you've got good scientific data. Name the manufacturers, name the places. It makes stories come alive and it actually makes the public sit up and pay attention. It takes it from being an abstract issue to being a real one for real people. That's a fair point. Um, I think, uh, in fairness to people who have um, been doing such research, uh, there are reasons why they've not been allowed to do that. It's not because we don't want to. But, um, there are constraints that you work on that you should make that difficult. But I take the point that you have to make this um, attractive and interesting for people to sit up and take notice. So um, I'll definitely do that. And of course, you, I think you were reporting on James Tate's work at uh, Leeds where he mentioned um, Boxer, uh, General Motors anyway, which came out of some work that he was doing. Well, his um, previous report on the exact same issue, he didn't name any yeah. manufacturers. Mm -hmm. got around to the original century.
the stage that we did invite them on two occasions and DSC, but um, they, they didn't send them in the final. So, yeah. David. Yes. Just a, a quick point uh, in relation to the media coverage. Uh, the we do, although we we concentrate on the on the health uh, effects. It seems that so much of the media coverage has uh, concentrated on the on the financial uh, and fiscal uh, aspects of this, uh, looking for compensation for motorists rather than just one mention from the uh, transport secretary uh, about. Uh, a possible uh, uh, class uh, manslaughter case uh, that s s seems to have uh, vanished. Uh, I just wonder if uh, a friend uh, next door to me would uh, like to comment on that. Uh, well, I don't know. I haven't. The only way you could answer that is looking at all the articles and going through them and seeing what the actual balance is. But uh, we've run about 27, 28 articles on air pollution. And um, I think the first third are probably entirely about health, and so several of those things. So I'm not sure that really applies to us. And I think the other issue is the way the data comes out. If it comes out about Volkswagen cheating, uh, then it's, it's going to be focused on Volkswagen only. But uh, as I said earlier, there's lots of ways of shifting the balance. So we just need to know hard, concrete facts about particular countries. <coughs> scientific candidates about the impact of health. Yes. I'm happy to send you the answers in terms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, we've been banging the drum um, in within the community on health for a considerable time. Um, but um, the debate had considerable impetus in September when it was running the corporate council. So um, I think that is, is quite instructive. Um, but we're happy to... Um, um, Ignite the debate by whatever means mm -hmm. is possible. Really. Um, well, that might be a beautiful moment to uh, conclude, actually. So, um, thank you to uh, everyone for your contribution.